What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well, yesterday was the day Spider-Man 2 reviews are now out and it appears we have another Game of the Year contender on our hands. And in fact, this may be Insomniac's best release they've ever done. We'll go over all of that though here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about what looks like a brand new Nintendo 64 console for 2024 that's capable of 4K. And we'll also be talking about Sonic as of course Superstars is out today, but it looks like Sega is gearing up for a new Sonic game next year, at least according to some leaked documents. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with some news that kind of came out of left field as a higher up at Bethesda is ready to move on, and that's Pete Hines. Now he posted this up over on Twitter, where he says, after 24 years, I decided my time at Bethesda Softworks has come to an end. I am retiring and will begin an exciting new chapter of my life, exploring interests and passions, donating my time where I can, and taking more time to enjoy life. This was not a decision I came to easily or quickly, but after an amazing career, culminating in the incredible launch of Starfield, feels like the time is right. I saw some people reading into this more than they really needed to, to be out like, oh, is something happening with Bethesda he's getting pushed out or within Microsoft? No, I, I think Pete Hines is just, just ready to move on, ready to retire. As he mentioned, the culminated with Starfield's release that we know went back quite a while with what Todd Howard had been saying, kind of talking about the history over the past, like, couple of decades for it. So rather than stay on and start to spin up the development around Elder Scrolls 6 between projects those si that size, yeah, it's probably time to really move on and retire at that point. So that's about as far as I think this one goes. And congratulations to Pete Hines, again, at, at the top of Bethesda, working, helping to get a lot of these games out, setting things up for what's become a big time publisher and developer in games. Also, it looks like Netflix is continuing to get more and more serious about their games offering on their service that's mostly known for streaming movies and shows. But peers, according to the Wall Street Journal, they were in talks or maybe are still in talks with Take Two for Grand Theft Auto. Now this was reported by Wall Street Journal. It is behind a paywall, but we'll take a look here. This posted up by Eurogamer who says, uh, according to the publication, Netflix believes a more significant gaming presence will help it attract new subscribers and retain existing ones by giving them something to engage with between seasons of their favorite shows. Going on to say that they had discussions to release a game within Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto series via a licensing deal as part of its escalating gaming ambitions. But the Wall Street Journal offered no hint as to the title it might have been targeting or if the discussions have borne fruit. And it's my understanding that this specific discussion was about already existing Grand Theft Auto games, not a brand new one. As in, hey, we have mobile versions that have released in the past for some of these PS2 era Grand Theft Auto games. Can we move them over and release them for phones and, and tablets through Netflix specifically or streaming on TVs? And we've seen that with Microsoft and xCloud where they have their Xbox app that will allow you to stream on things like what Samsung TVs. I believe they opened it up further there. Netflix has been kind of playing around with that. And I think getting something like Grand Theft Auto into their service would work to show that they are a bit more serious. And as they mentioned, give you something else to engage with between seasons of something like Stranger Things. So we'll see if anything comes of this, but it's at least interesting to note that uh, Netflix is at least getting a bit more serious to where they are seeking out talks with some of these major publishers. Oh, and we did get an update for the best selling game of all time when it comes to how many more sales they've made, and that's uh, Minecraft. And well, you can see this headline here, this over on Windows Central saying, Minecraft crosses 300 million copies sold. As it prepares to celebrate its 15th anniversary, we've joked about how how strong GTA 5 is with its sales. However, this would place Minecraft about 115 million copies ahead of GTA 5. Yes, Minecraft is behemoth, and it's, it's the best selling game of all time. And it seems like it's gonna continue selling because they have no plans of slowing down with their 15th anniversary and their Minecraft Live had all kinds of updates and collaborations they were showing off. So how much further does Minecraft go? Well, it's hard to say. Could they someday reach a billion soul? Will there ever be a Minecraft 2? 
Who knows, but at least for now, 300 million copies sold is absolutely ridiculous. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Spider-Man 2. It's out this Friday alongside of Super Mario Brothers Wonder and I mentioned Sonic Superstars out today. It's, it's a pretty good week in, in games, but we did get those reviews yesterday for Spider-Man 2 and I was curious, could Insomniac break into the 90s with the Spider-Man franchise? It's something they've been looking to do just in general for a long time, I think almost, I think almost 20 years. It's been a while since they found themselves in that 90 Metacritic range and technically while they have a lot of output, they haven't necessarily had that big release that would put them alongside of something like a Naughty Dog or Sony Santa Monica. Until now, where we can see over on Metacritic, Spider-Man 2 sitting at a 91. And in fact, it's all positive. It's like 122 positive reviews, zero mixed, zero negative. People seem extremely happy with what they've played here for review. For example, Games Radar says, Spider-Man 2 improves on its predecessor across the board while saluting the superhero genre over the last 30 years as a whole. With a captivating narrative and unrivaled spectacle, it's the quintessential superhero game in story and mechanical terms. We also have The Loadout who says Spider-Man 2 is hands down the best game of the PS5 era so far. It's visually stunning, narratively brilliant, and somehow it manages to improve Insomniac's already stellar traversal and combat from previous Spidey games. It's a masterpiece. And the, the lowest score I could find was an 8 out of 10 or an 80. I believe IGN gave it like an 8 out of 10, but also Level Up who says, Marvel Spider-Man 2 excels in delivering a spectacular combat system and seamlessly fluid traversal mechanics. The game truly shines when it lets you swing through Manhattan cityscape at breakneck speeds, a thrilling highlighted experience. Yet where Insomniac Games stumbles is in the narrative and certain design choices. The inclusion of stealth sections and an over-reliance on cinematic quick time events tracks from player agency. Marvel Spider-Man 2 doesn't reinvent the wheel, but also doesn't significantly improve its rotation. I mentioned that Insomniac had been trying to break back in the 90s for a while. Uh, actually, Shinobi pointed this one out on Twitter saying, Spider-Man 2 is Insomniac's first 90 plus on Metacritic since Ratchet & Clank up your arsenal, that being in 2004. So almost 20 years, 19 years essentially, right? Uh, that, it, that it took them to get back into that 90 range. And it's harder now than ever, I'll say, to break in that 90 spot uh, because we've seen a lot of other Sony studios come up to that, like that high 80s range, but not quite get a couple of points up. This is it for Insomniac. And also consider the fact that Insomniac's output has been very, very impressive compared to the field, like just around the, even just in games, not necessarily just Sony studios, just, just in games in general. I mean, they, they needed a Spider-Man game at launch. So what do they do? They drop Spider-Man Miles Morales cross-gen. Also at Spider-Man Remastered. Then they show up a little later on with Ratchet and Clank. Here they are now with Spider-Man 2. And oh yeah, they also have Wolverine coming up in a couple of, of years. So I think that's the best way to do it, by the way. Give us an idea as to what's coming potentially five years down the road, but also they have something else coming up in the meantime with Spider-Man 2. So Insomniac, it's hard to argue against the idea of them being Sony's best studio right now. Also keep in mind that they are responsible for uh, what's what it appears to be a good relationship between Sony and Marvel as Wolverine coming into the fold. Who knows what other superhero intellectual properties Sony maybe wants to work with Marvel for and not even just with Insomniac, maybe with others, but Insomniac is right there in the middle delivering some of these high quality experiences like a Spider-Man 2. And I'll admit I, I've kind of shied away a bit from from looking at a lot of gameplay and, and video for this title, mostly because I'm already sold on it. I didn't want there to be too much that was shown off and spoiled necessarily because I even took a look at that launch trailer from Sony and I was a little surprised. There was some stuff in there. I was like, well, okay, I guess that's happening in, Sp in Spider-Man 2. Enemies, uh, different characters, cameos and stuff. Like it's weird to say, but I wouldn't watch the launch trailer if you're worried about spoilers in the game. Again, strange because that's official marketing from Sony. Nonetheless though, impressive stuff from Insomniac. I am really excited for Friday, having a great uh, superhero game with Spider-Man 2 coming out. Seemingly the setup here for an awesome 2D Mario game alongside of it. There's just games galore. And, and again, it's 2023. 
just keeps on going. And I will say this is setting up for a very compelling lineup for game of the year in December. We'll see at this point who makes the cut for just the nominations because it feels like we're gonna have at least one or two games that score in the 90s that might not make it. Next up, let's talk about a brand new Nintendo 64 game that was lightly announced, we'll say. I mean, borderline, it was teased, although we did get some information around it. And this is coming from Analog. I know it's probably already sold out, but hey, it's, it's interesting enough to see this kind of push for the Nintendo 64 side of third-party systems because they haven't been great necessarily, even if they've been somewhat attempted, but emulation still kind of sketchy on it. And we've basically come back to just continue to modify the original hardware. And I mean, there's only so many Nintendo 64s out there. So the idea of seeing a brand new system made from the ground up to specifically play Nintendo 64 games through FPGA, I, hopefully turns out to be a good product, but we can see this posted up over on their website where they say analog 3D, the future is here, 64 bits of pleasure. They go over some of the, the details here, including wireless Bluetooth, 2.4 gigahertz, four original style controller ports. So you will be able to use your original Nintendo 64 controllers now with the the, <laughs> the lazy stick and everything. Uh, completely engineered in FPGA, meaning they're going to design the, they're gonna design hardware specific to the task rather than have, I guess, software emulation. FPGA, still technically emulation more down to the hardware level as opposed to just software emulation takes a bit more to brute force that, I get it. Still though, their recent outings with pretty much any of these other systems have been good. The issue comes down to just being able to get the device. I, I understand that completely. Analog OS, no emulation again, with, that's, depending on how your take is on emulation, but they do say 4K resolution, original display modes, reference quality recreations of specific model CRTs and PVMs, and will have 100% compatibility in every region, USA, EU, and Japan coming in 2024. There's also this rendering of a controller. Now, if we take this and blow up the brightness a bit, you'll be able to get a much better look at this silhouette they were trying to show. And it looks like, I I, I guess this is gonna be 8-Bit Doe who's gonna make this alongside of them. And they've partnered before with some of their controllers that work with the analog systems. I, interesting stuff. I, I'm curious how this will work with shooters as we know the stick tracking can be kind of rough when it tries to be recreated by third party controllers, but at least at first glance and what's shown here looks much more, we'll say usable than the, the original Nintendo 64 controller. And while I still have a lot of questions around this device, I, I'm interested. I would like to see what they can do with this and a 4K enabled Nintendo 64 built from the ground up with FPGA could provide some impressive results, but that's kind of where we are now. We're gonna wait for those results. They're gonna have to show it off obviously, well, I assume before they try to take a bunch of money from people because this is not gonna be cheap. I, I wouldn't be shocked if it's four, 500, even $600 based on what they're describing here and really, how much the market is, would like to see something like this. I, again, it's Nintendo 64 emulation, not the greatest. The hardware that's available, unless you're gonna be soldering an Ultra 64 is touch and go. So yeah, keep an eye on this one. I'll keep you guys, of course, up to date because I am absolutely fascinated with the idea of this and what kind of results they can actually get out of an FPGA chip and 4K Nintendo 64 gameplay off of original cartridges. Next up, let's talk about Sonic and maybe a brand new game for 2024. Now, this was making the rounds with a slide that was allegedly from a presentation, I assume within uh, Sega US. And in this slide, which you can see here, they do discuss 2023 as well as 2024. This slide went up on Reddit and they got pulled down fairly quickly, but many publications like VGC managed to get screenshots of it and were able to run stories from this. And it got people talking about the slide mentioning 2024 with new game Holiday. It's also Superstars DLC, which wouldn't shock me at all. A new mobile game, Sonic Prime Season 3, a Knuckles TV show, and even Sonic 3 movie. Now, these could just be, there's a few things here. These could be announcements as well as releases, but I feel like if New Game Holiday 
is a big 3D Sonic game, that that might just be an announcement. And like we just had Sonic Frontiers, the downloadable content, they had it in waves and the most recent one kind of finished all of that up. So sure, you go into holiday 2024, maybe that's a good spot to announce and kind of drop the idea for the next big 3D Sonic game, probably to play off of what Frontiers introduced and maybe try to work out some of the pop in, I, I get it. But in this case, it could also be maybe a remake, a remaster. We get those compilations from time to time from Sega as well. And there's still plenty that they could work on from that Xbox 360 era, like Sonic, o okay, yeah, sure. But I think Sonic, Adventure, maybe a brand new one there, Sonic Adventure 3, but they have to be really confident they're going to do that. So maybe they do a compilation of some of those older 3D Sonic games, put it in one package and release it for a holiday 2024. But I am genuinely curious from the big Sonic fans out there who follow the series, what would you like to see next holiday? Do you think they'd really be ready to go with the next big 3D Sonic game? Or could this be a title that maybe bridges the gap a bit? That of course, if this slide that's making the rounds is correct at all in, in the first place. But hey, I, I guess we'll see since there are some other things on there we can look forward to in the meantime for 2024 to see if this pans out. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about some new details that have gotten out there around Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League. And I know the hype completely deflated for this one when they showed it and it looked kind of old and kind of basic and generic. And then it was like, oh, it's a lot of live service stuff. There's numbers all over the place. There's gear, loadouts and... Sure, but they did push it to February, so we're still kind of on the road for the release of this game in that first week. And some of the details, I mean, I guess it's at least adding to what we can expect from it. Now, it's interesting because this once again comes from Reddit. However, the mods at Re on Reddit apparently saw so much proof that this is correct that they just put the legit badge next to it and even went to further to re reassure people that this is correct. So we can see this posted up, this again over on Reddit, where a person says they saw an internal, not final trailer at a trade show. And yes, there's a deluxe edition and a day one edition, which the deluxe edition gets you three days early access, a battle pass points, extra cost. That's enough to me to, co that convinces me immediately <laughs> that there would be a deluxe edition. There you go. But they have real time weather. They have day night cycle. Metropolis is twice the size of Gotham and Arkham Knight. Rocksteady already working on one year of extra content. New characters and mi uh, missions were mentioned. They state clearly you could play the game co-op online or play it all solo and switch between the four different characters it's it is tough to get excited for the latest rocksteady title and it really is a shame because it's been so long since arkham knight i was really hoping for some interesting path with suicide squad that just feels so cookie cutter with some of these live service titles we've we've seen but I'm still gonna give it a shot. It's first week of February, and at least it appears there are some extra details with things like day, night cycle, a large city to explore, but also premium battle pass coins and deluxe editions and all the basic tropes you'd expect. But we're not too far off, a couple of months, and we'll see if that delay was worth it or if they should've just pushed out the door earlier this year and moved on after that. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're taking a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I ask, which of these do you think is Sony's best studio? Wow, Insomniac, 60%. Naughty Dog at 22%. I'm a little surprised on that being above Santa Monica Studio. That being 11%, I only say that because God of War Ragnarok came out and it was good. It was really good. Naughty Dog has, I feel like Naughty Dog has been kind of spinning their wheels a bit to start this generation. Not that they can't recover with uh, some big time releases, like apparently the new IP they're working on, a Last of Us Part 3 maybe to close out the generation. I mean, really Sucker Punch being like way down there, they might show up with an incredible looking Ghost Tsushima too. So to me right now, Insomniac game stock way up. Naughty Dog stock, it's been taking a hit. So I'd like to see them recover, but it, it really is hard to argue against Insomniac really being Sony's strongest and most important studio right now. They've pretty much been carrying the PS5 specifically on their back this entire way. Maybe not with the level of a God of War Ragnarok in terms of that blockbuster, like Metacritic score type game, although Spider-Man 2, 91, but we need that consistent flow of games. They've been there the whole time and seems like they're still setting up with Wolverine 
and apparently a multiplayer game as well. So impressive stuff there. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Dom who says, Sonic might not be perfect, but it still looks like fun for a 2D Sonic game. I'll pick this one up with Mario Wonder. Yeah, I don't really know what people expect out of these 2D Sonic games. I, I don't know, some are thinking these, these should be like 90 plus narrative, incredible experiences. I'm just looking for a fun 2D Sonic game. And I think sometimes we do read too much into the scores, I will admit, because if Sonic Superstars is a 76, but it feels like a really fun 2D Sonic game that obviously uh, plays into some of the fan service stuff. Sure, that's a fun release. I'm, I'm on board with that one. And yeah, I'm gonna be picking it up today and checking it out. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Whether well, Spider-Man 2 coming in at a 91 on Metacritic. Big time release for Insomniac. Are you picking it up this Friday? And then also, what about a brand new 4K Nintendo 64 system set up for 2024? How hard do you think that one's gonna be to get? And then a new Sonic game next holiday? Do you think it's the next big 3D Sonic game or maybe something to bridge the gap in the meantime? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.